get started again, we're going to go ahead and um, get ready to stream live again. So our next guest is um, Susan, Susan Marshall. She's a dietitian nutritionist uh, from Children's Hospital, Colorado. Today she's going to share with us um, basically her role in the lives of um, CDH children. She may talk about different feeding um, therapies and techniques, to fed children, um, failure to thrive, weight gain, and overall healthy nutrition for CDH children, because we know that this um, tends to be a common area of um, struggle with these CDH kids. So I will um, turn it over to Susan, and she'll get from here. Uh, thank you. Um, again, I'm a naked dietitian over at Children's Hospital. Um, Myself and one of my co-workers, there's two of us in the NICU, and we follow these children from when they're admitted into the NICU through their discharge. Um, and then we're also, depending on where your child or um, follows up for care, whether it's here or somewhere else, our dietitians here also follow these children in special care clinic to continue to help meet their needs because they have continued um, issues with growth and development and things even past their hospitalization. So I'm going to kind of talk about some some of the issues that we have in the NICU, as she mentioned, with growth and failure to thrive, um, feeding intolerances, and what we do to work through those. Um, so, and again, I'll leave some questions at the end for you guys' questions and comments. Um, so one of my objectives here is to discuss with you guys the importance of nutrition, um, because a lot of their medical um, needs are a lot higher. But nutrition is very important, especially in these children who have high increased energy needs, they have um, a lot of, uh, when they're in critical status, they sometimes can have muscle breakdown and other things that affects their pulmonary status as well as their overall growth. And even if we try to give these babies nutrition to the best of our abilities, we still see long-term growth failure over time. And um, so again, I'm going to discuss some of the things that we can do to help prevent that. Um, I'm also going to discuss, like she said, different modes of nutrition support, whether it's through the IV or whether it's through the GI tract when we start transitioning those um, to, to um, taking feeds by mouth. And um, I'm also going to identify some barriers that we have with nutrition support. Sometimes we would love to give these kids their optimal needs, but sometimes it's just not feasible given the circumstances. So um, uh, the role of the dietitian, we work with a team daily. We attend daily rounds, myself and my coworker. We kind of divide up the different sides of the unit. And we'll round the team, we'll make our recommendations, we'll discuss the patient's clinical status so that we know what to recommend and what's feasible. Um, and of course, we document on them. We look at their labs, we look at their whole picture to identify what's best for the individual patient because not all patients are the same as you probably all know. They're all very different. Um, and again, follow up after discharge. I don't do that part. My coworker tends to follow these kids after discharge. Um, which is a nice kind of conti continuity of care, um, being able to know these kids and patients to be able to know them better for their outpatient needs. So when we, um, when a, a little one first gets admitted to us, um, and we, before we administer nutrition support, we look at their weight, we look at length. Um, sometimes these things are difficult to assess because of fluids, because they have lots of tubes in them, because they'll have IVs and other things that contribute. Um, we'll look at different signs, like if they have a lot of edema and we don't give them the real weight. Um, if they're premature, we do have premature babies, sometimes they have different set of needs than if they were born full term. Um, also, depending on the severity of their CDH, they're gonna have different nutrient needs, and so we'll look at that um, to evaluate the best course. Um, we look daily at their ins intake, so through the IV fluid, we look at how much is coming in and how much is going out. So we kind of know, okay, are we having a right balance here? Um, sometimes it's uh, difficult to assess their growth right off because, um, again, with their clinical status, we don't know what's fluids and what's real weight gain and what's not real weight gain. Um, uh, we also look at you know birth history and things of the parents and you know, if there's any um, thing that would set their baby apart. Um, so our goal as a nutrition support, our goal is to promote. Yeah, I don't know what I'm okay. supposed to do. I'll fix it. You can keep going. Okay. I have a slide presentation that's going to try to get going. <laughs> that's why I'm reading off this. Um, so our goal, of course, is to promote adequate weight gain. We want them to not growth faltering or failure to thrive where they fall off their growth charts. Long-term um, 
malnutrition or poor nutrition can lead to other problems like poor length growth, poor height development, poor brain growth. So again, these are things we try to initiate right away so that we can kind of prevent all those things from happening. Um, nutrition is important for healing. As we know, these babies are going to require surgeries, sometimes multiple surgeries. Um, these require extra nutrients to help them heal and to help them grow. Um, we also want to prevent any nutrient deficiencies. A lot of medications that these infants have to be on um, can um, deplete their bone stores, they can deplete their muscle stores. Um, so can I say it again? You sure may. Okay. They don't need to. Or he's got, actually, he oh. has. We look at their growth genes, growth charts. Um, there's different sets of growth charts depending if they were premature or if they were full term. There's different weight trajectories. So we like to look at that because one weight in time is not a good indicator because, as I mentioned, fluid status or other clinical conditions can change their weight. So one week they might be flat, but then as long as we kind of see that they're following their own curve, even if it's on a lower curve, you know, some parents are fatigued, their families are fatigued, we're not going to expect a baby at the top of the growth chart. Um, so again, that's why medical history, when I mean, the parents' history is important. If we have, you know, two very tall parents, most of the very short. Um, um, so different modes of nutrition support that we use are total parental nutrition. Oftentimes you might hear it in the unit is TPN. That's basically feeding through their veins. Um, uh, and then there's also, usually that's what they're started on, and then they can progress to enteral nutrition, which is through the gut. Usually it's given through a tube at first because they're unable to eat. Um, so we will put formula or breast milk through their tube to help them meet their nutrient needs. Um, babies, like I said, aren't started on oral feeds until a little bit later once their clinical status is improved. So first we're going to talk about the IV form of nutrition, because um, that's our first mode of delivery. So um, this is important because when we can't use it, um, infant's gut, we need to get the nutrition and we need to get it right away to prevent all the complications that I mentioned before. So this is able to prove we are able to provide calories and protein and fat and vitamins, minerals, and all the electrolytes that they need. Um, the reason that we would use parental nutrition is a non-functional gut, which most of these don't have because they're on a lot of medications. Um, sometimes it can slow the gut motility um, and blood flow to the gut. Um, a lot of times, the res most of the times, the respiratory status is not allow us to feed by gut. And uh, ideally, we like to feed within 24 to 48 hours. In our unit, as soon as they come in, we have something called starter TPN, which is almost like a stock TPN ready to go, so that we can start right away without having to wait for it to be ordered and to be made. So in our unit, we try to start it immediately. Sometimes they might have to start with IV fluids, um, and then we will progress to full calories and protein. So um, as I mentioned, we'll provide sugar which is we call dextrose, um, amino acids, which is the protein that we get the babies, and um, lipids or fat. And then some of the micronutrients um, that we'll also give them is the vitamins, the minerals they need, um, electrolytes, a lot of times they have electrolyte imbalances because again, fluid status, because the medications that they need to do. So we can help adjust that with the nutrition that we give them to help them balance it out. Um, so there are some limitations. Parental nutrition isn't ideal. Um, it's the best thing that we have to make sure that we meet the needs of the infant. Um, so sometimes what we want to give them is limited because they have lots of IVs, they have lots of medications, and we only have limited access of how many places we can put these things. So sometimes if, even if we want to give them bowls, it's limited. Um, also the amount that will fit into a bag if we have very little volume doesn't really allow. If we want three grams of protein in there, but you only have this much fluid, it doesn't always work. Um, also, the longer you have lines in, the increased risk of infection. So as soon as the baby is able to, their status allows us to, and is able to use the gut, we try to get some of those lines out to help prevent the risk of infection. Um, so once they're able, once their gut starts to kind of wake up, once we think they have more gut perfusion, we can kind of look at their clinical symptoms, we can look at their skin color, their respiratory symptoms to say, okay, maybe this kid can have little trickle feeds. We'll start on um, nutrition through the gut. So as I mentioned, there's different forms. Um, nasogastric feedings, which the tube goes through their nose and into the stomach. Um, what we call transpyloric, sometimes you might hear it referred to as TP feeds on the unit. That's where it goes past the stomach, but directly into the intestine. 
Um, and then eventually, when they can, they can try little bits to feed by mouth. Um, some babies aren't always safe to eat by mouth, or they're not able to meet all of their nutritional needs right away by the mouth, and so sometimes that requires a surgical placement for feeding too. So, as you can see, the nurse will put the feeding tube up through the nose, and it goes down into their stomach. Um, this is usually the first thing that we use. Sometimes premature infants will use it through their mouth or if they can't get it through the nose, but most of the time we use it through the nose. Um, this allows us to be able to feed before the infant is able to do it by themselves. And um, it's, we typically have been administering it via what we call a continuous drip. So we give little small amounts over a 24 hour period. Um, and eventually, um, when they get a little bit more stable, um, we're able to kind of give it more intermittently, like you would feed a regular infant every three hours to get a larger volume. Um, so a transpide work tube, the one that goes directly past the stomach and into the intestine, um, this one sometimes we have to use because of their respiratory status. Sometimes they're working very hard to breathe. Um, it kind of helps if they don't have this load in their stomach and if they can just be given small amounts of food right through their intestine. Also, some babies are at risk for what we call aspiration, where um, if you have stomach contents and you're having difficulty breathing, it can actually come back up and if it goes into the lungs, then we have complications. So sometimes if you push it farther down the intestine, the likelihood of it coming back up is a lot less. Um, so if they have a transpylorid tube, they have to be given continuously. Because unlike the stomach where you have a kind of a basin to hold the feeds for a long period of time, in the intestine you don't have that basin. It's just a small tube. So we can't we have to give it through a continuous 24-hour drip um, while they're having a TP. Um, some infants, while they have this special kind of tube, require what we call a hydrolyzed formula, which means broken down. So formula that's proteins have been broken down and the components have been broken down. Because if it bypasses the stomach, you don't have all the enzymes to help break up the formula or the breast milk. So sometimes in these infants, um, we'll have to temporarily use a formula that's a little bit more broken down um, until we can put it back into the stomach um, or until they're tolerating their feeds. So um, oral feedings, um, the length of time that it starts for infants to start this really depends on each baby. Some babies with smaller defects um, can start uh, oral feedings a little bit sooner. Um, some babies with the bigger defects have, you know, uh, what we call feeding intolerances. It's not moving like it should be, um, or they're having really hard work of breathing. Um, and so they're unable to coordinate that sucking, swallowing, and breathing all at the same time. Um, Sometimes babies will have, you know, other surgical interventions that will kind of deter our progress and kind of make us take a couple steps back before we go back forward. So there is no really length of time that is estimated for any baby. It really varies. It can be weeks to months. Um, even once, uh, we have occupational therapists at our facility who kind of help us evaluate, is this baby ready to start eating? Or no, is their clinical status not really allow us to? Occupational therapists can also evaluate the safety of when they start feeds and are they aspirating this or is it coming up into their lungs? Are they choking? Um, so we have them help uh, evaluate this Bye. readiness. Um, even infants who are safe to feed by mouth, um, sometimes they have oral aversions, like if you put anything near their mouth, they kind of gag, they kind of push away. Um, this happens a lot of times just because they've, not, they've had tubes in their mouth, they've had a lot of other procedures, they've, it, um, they don't like any, even pacifiers, they'll reject. So again, that's kind of our occupational therapists and people will work with the baby and will work with the families to help develop these skills in babies so that eventually they can progress to eating by mouth. Um, we like to give the babies the benefit of the doubt. We like to work with them. We like to give them time and give them a chance to eat because they've been through a lot. But um, sometimes they make very little progress. Um, they're still only taking little bits by mouth here and there. Or they have significant um, feeding intolerance or emesis uh, that kind of deters them from meeting all of their needs by mouth. Um, in order to send these babies home safely and to help them progress sometimes, they require what we call a gastrostomy too. Um, so we can give them their nutrition through there. And that's more of a long-term thing. So this is just kind of a little picture. Um, on the uh, that side of there, <coughs> the, the skin where the feeding tube goes in, and it goes directly into the stomach. Um, and that way, you know, we can send parents home if the baby is otherwise kind of stable. 
um, and they can work on the feeds at home. They can still work with occupational therapy to work on these feeds, but still give them their nutrition to help them meet their needs. So there's many different types of enteral feeds or feeds through the gut that we can use. So I'm going to talk about many of the different forms. Breast milk, we always say is best. So we really encourage moms to try to pump if they can, even if it's just for a little bit of time, um, just to kind of get those babies' initial feedings. And I'll describe why breast milk is usually ideal. Um, sometimes for moms who aren't able to produce enough breast milk, um, because they're stressed, because the clinical status, there's a lot of reasons why they can't fully support this baby. Um, and we do have formulas available that will help meet the nutritional needs. And I'll go over the different types of formula um, depending on the infant. So one of the um, best things about breast milk is it provides a combination of nutrients that labs and mankind cannot mimic. We can try our best to mimic what breast milk is like, but we can't. Um, breast milk has a lot of beneficial nutrients. It helps with um, gastrointestinal emptying, so it kind of doesn't let it sit in the stomach as long. It kind of helps the stomach empty into the intestines. It also provides um, immunity to the baby. Um, it's a little easier to digest, which some of these babies, as I'll talk about in a little while, have feeding intolerances. So a lot of times breast milk helps them kind of digest a little bit better. Some studies are showing that it actually helps with intestinal adaptation because of something called prebiotics, which is a type of carbohydrate. So um, there's a lot of good things in breast milk. Um, as I mentioned, it's easier to digest primarily because the type of protein that's in there, called whey protein. And um, like I said, it helps stimulate growth, um, it helps mature the gut, and it helps things kind of move through. Um, although they cannot immediately be put to breast, because usually they're probably still intubated or they're receiving report from a ventilator, um, we can provide it, we have mom's pump, and then we can provide it through two. So your baby can still get the benefits of the breast milk even if they can't breastfeed right then. Um, and again, it's important for our medical team to support a mother's desire to breastfeed or provide breast milk. Um, you know, encouragement, we have lactation services who can work with our mothers, especially those who are really struggling with their supply um, or who have questions or who have issues. Um, and again, even if you are unable to provide breast milk for the whole year that is recommended by the American County Pediatrics, if you can provide it for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, anything you can give the baby, even if it's just intermittent, is still a benefit. Um, and also, providing breast milk to your infant allows mothers to help out in some way. It's very, you guys have very little control over what's going on from a medical standpoint. And so this is kind of your way to give back. If you're able to, and if you're willing to, this is something you can do to help your infant and help their immunity and help their defenses when otherwise there's very little you can do. Um, although we consider ideal source in many ways, um, babies with congenital diaphragmatic hernias have increased nutrition needs that breast milk just can't meet alone. So a lot of times we have to, what we call fortify the breast milk and add additives to it in our milk lab um, in order to meet the protein needs, to support growth, and to help meet all their bone needs. So the fortifiers that um, we add, and I'll talk about these two, um, they are added to the breast milk and they increase the calories of protein. And calcium and phosphorus, I'll describe later too, those are important for their bones. These infants are on a lot of medications that are not bone friendly. And so this kind of helps replete their bones and helps prevent um, them from developing what an osteoporosis type thing called osteopenia. Um, so we'll work with the medical team to determine which fortifier is best for this specific infant. Because again, there's a lot of different choices and different reasons for the choices. So we kind of work based on the baby and based on, you know, kind of what their status is at the time and how they're doing. So again, I know this is kind of overwhelming. So. I'm, you know, I'll go through it, but um, I just wanted to kind of include everything because there's a lot of different reasons why we use these. So the number one that we probably use is called human milk fortifier. It's just a little vial of um, that we add to the breast milk. Um, it's uh, now manufactured as hydrolyzed, as I mentioned, broken down, so it's easier for these babies to digest it than the previous fortifiers. Um, it also contains a type of fat in it called a medium chain fat. This is a certain fat that's easier for babies to digest. And again, when we have infants whose um, abdominal contents maybe were up in their chest at birth, when they push those intestines back down, they don't put it how it was designed to go. It just kind of goes. So sometimes it doesn't always flow, and so it's easier for these infants to digest and break down. Um, 
It's also a very good source of protein. They added more protein to this specific fortifier, so it helps with growth, with muscle, preventing muscle breakdown. Um, and as I mentioned, the calcium and the phosphorus, which are very key nutrients, um, and also has other vitamins and minerals that these babies need. Um, this is the ideal source for preterm infants, because if the baby is born prematurely, they're already born without nutrient stores. You develop a lot of those nutrient stores in the last trimester, and depending on how early they were born, they might not have gotten full nutrients, or they might not have put on that extra fat layer like they're supposed to in the last trimester. Um, if there is a full-term infant, you will still use the human milk fortifier for, again, the above reasons that it has more uh, protein and it has more of the goodies in it. But there's also um, uh, what we call standard-term formula, like the, you might send a regular baby home on standard products. I and mean, then it's available as a liquid, so we can add that to the breast milk, um, depending on, again, the needs of that infant. Um, this is an intact cow's milk protein, so babies who have any type of protein, milk protein intolerances might not do as well on this formula. Um, we also, we pretty much use the top one, the human milk fortifier, or what we call the hydrolyzed formula, the broken down one, because again, with these babies who have difficulty digesting some of their feeds, it's a little bit easier for them to digest. It's higher in protein than the regular formula. Um, and so we usually will kind of add virtual combination both. Sometimes we'll add some human milk fortifier and we'll just kind of play around with it. Kind of um, there's also other options. We call them modulars, but they're just little extra things that we add. Um, as I mentioned, the medium chain triglycerides are the type of fat that's easier for the body to digest in these infants. So sometimes it'll come as an oil and we can just get a Kruger tube with their feet. Um, because this way, um, it's a little bit easier on their gut compared to if we just keep increasing the calories of the formula with other things like protein and all these other additives. So sometimes babies do better on this one. Um, again, it's kind of a fine balance because we don't want to give baby just pure fat. We want to give them kind of combination of both. But sometimes we'll have to use this because some infants don't tolerate all the above. So for babies who are born prematurely, which means less than 37 weeks, um, they have limited fat stores depending on how early they were born. Um, and also, again, their bone mineral accretion hasn't happened, and um, they don't have all the stores that a normal uh, term baby would have. So if a baby is unable to receive breast milk or the parents don't want to provide breast milk or they're unable to provide breast milk um, and they're premature, we prefer the premature formulas because it helps meet the special needs of this population. It helps us to prevent nutrient deficiencies, which sometimes we can see if they're not given a premature formula, and their weight gain also improves on formulas like this. So a standard term formula that you might buy in the grocery store um, uh, at home. Um, these ones, once uh, if, uh, unable to have breast milk, these are usually what we choose for these term infants. Um, again, it's cow's milk based, so sometimes babies who have kind of the cow's milk protein intolerance or if they have lactose intolerance, we'll have to choose a different formula. Um, but they are available in lower lactose forms, kind of like a gentle form, um, that some babies do much better on. And I've seen that, I've switched them to a lower lactose formula and they do fabulously. So again, every baby is very different and sometimes we'll have to try many different formulas and many different combinations until we find the right one. The broken down formulas, again, are indicated for those babies who don't tolerate the other things that we talked about. Um, or babies who were getting those feeds into their intestine. Um, although we would like to ideally provide all breast milk if that's what mom's providing, um, sometimes we kind of have to mix it 50-50 with this type of formula if they demonstrate poor weight gain and they're not absorbing what we're giving to them. Um, we rarely have to use these. They're called elemental formulas, which just means completely broken down. Instead of partially broken down, they're all the way broken down. So um, sometimes for babies with allergies, like milk protein allergies, not seasonal allergies, but milk protein allergies, um, these are the best formulas for them. Um, sometimes these ones are a little bit harder on the gut. So um, again, we don't like to go this route until we have to, even though they're easier to break down what we call osmotic load. Sometimes it can uh, draw on the fluids and it can, uh, babies don't like them as much. Again, some babies do fine on them, so it's baby dependent. Um, every, I didn't want to talk about all the different conditions because there's a lot of different things and it doesn't happen to every baby. Um, but there, there's a condition called chylophorax. Sometimes when with surgeries and stuff, things can get nicked. 
and um, there's something called Kyle, like a Kyle leak if um, you hear about that. And they require a special type of formula because of the way it's absorbed in the body. So there are different types of formulas available if a baby has a special need. Um, I don't think I've seen any metabolic babies, but if we were to have a baby with a metabolic condition, there are metabolic formulas out there. And again, I don't think I've seen one, so I didn't want to go over that type of thing because it really depends on them. But there's different types of specialty formulas available. And again, the dietitians and the doctors, we all work together to try to determine what's best for this baby. So how do we know when to initiate and how fast do we do that? Well, we don't usually initiate until the baby is clinically stable. Um, or we start with very, very what we call trophic, which is almost like just drips into the intestine just to kind of wake up the intestine and prevent it from what we call atrophying or kind of getting smaller and shrinking down, the little villi in there that absorb nutrients and kind of shrink. So sometimes we use it just to kind of wake up the gut and get it ready for when we start morphine. So um, again, when we first start them, usually they require the feeding tubes to give them the nutrition. And we start with small amounts. We kind of see how they do with those small amounts. If the baby is doing iffy, we'll keep them on the small amounts for several days. If they're, you know, if they're responding really well, then we'll incrementally increase. Sometimes it takes five days to get them up to the full feeds. Sometimes it may take them several weeks because they'll have to go backwards or they'll have a surgery, and then we have to start from square one. So again, some babies I've seen with smaller defects do really, really well, and we can get them up to full feeds. Some take a little bit longer because they have some um, struggles during the way. Um, Overall, as I've probably mentioned a million times, these babies have decreased nutritional needs. Some of these babies, you can throw calories, and you can throw calories and protein at them, and they will not grow. And they just, we watch their growth charts flatline. Um, it's very frustrating as a clinician to not be able to do it, but they're working very, very hard to breathe. They've had a lot of surgeries, which again, might make them have to go back on IV nutrition or not get their full nutrition. Um, sometimes if they're not tolerating their feeds, if they're having a lot of emesis, they're vomiting and not doing well, then we have to back down on the calories of their formula. So there's a lot of things that can kind of contribute to this. Um, and so, uh, like I said, besides the higher increased needs, if they've had surgery, they've had wound healing, they need wound healing. Um, and if they don't, then it kind of, it's harder to catch them back up. If, if we can't provide it initially for, you know, a week or so, then sometimes it has consequences months out just because it's really hard to get those stores back. Um, vitamins and minerals are also important for the group, not just the calories and the protein. As I mentioned, a lot of the medications that we use, um, like the diuretics, the steroids, um, they're really not bone friendly. They can kind of deplete the bone stores. Um, so it's really important, especially with calcium, with phosphorus, with zinc. Um, and if any of you have ever been up in the unit, well, I'm up there where vitamin D queens, we give out vitamin D like it's candy. Um, we really push it. Um, it's really important to help them absorb that calcium that they're getting. Um, they have, sometimes we'll double, triple what a normal term infant would get and we'll still see low vitamin D levels. So, um, and then some babies will have normal vitamin D levels and we'll be utterly surprised, like how did they do this? So again, we kind of monitor these things. We look at their bones. We look at what we're giving them. Um, again, as I mentioned, with one of the challenges getting the IV nutrition, sometimes we can't give the calcium the phosphorus that we need because if um, they have to have a line what we call peripheral line that's not central, um, we are not allowed to give those things because it can cause what we call burns um, because it's a smaller line. It can't, it's not going into circulation centrally. It's going up through there. So again, sometimes if they have to be managed with a, a line peripherally, um, it's harder to get all these things and then we kind of have to replete them later. So um, I'm just going to kind of go over the complications that we talked about and how we deal with them. So again, we've had limited calories because we don't have the fluid volume we want. Um, we don't have it because they have so many IVs in there that we can't always give them nutrition. Um, sometimes they'll lose an IV. Sometimes access is really hard to get on those infants. And if we lose IVs, they need their medication. So sometimes nutrition is the first thing to kind of be put on the back burner until they can get another line or another source in. Um, I, uh, occasionally we'll have an infant where that patch will come undone, where their closure, their surgical closure will come undone. So they'll start developing feeding intolerance again, and the intestines kind of go back up into the chest cavity. And, and at that point, again, it kind of takes us a couple steps back. 
um, depending on how long it's been up there, sometimes they can develop what we call strictures. So if you have an intestine, it'll be kind of a closure um, off on there. Or if, again, it won't be in continuity like it should. It'll be kind of mangled up. So again, sometimes these can lead to feeding a lot of um, vomiting. Um, they can't keep down their feeds. Sometimes projectile in nature. Um, so again, then we'll have to kind of stop feeds and move backwards. Um, gastroesophageal reflux, a lot of these little infants have it. Um, it's kind of where, you know, like adults, if you kind of have too much or kind of reflux is back up, you can get irritation. Um, sometimes uh, providers use thickened feeds. It's not always, it's not really proven, but it does help in a lot of infants, so if you choose to do it versus having to start with the patient. If they're orally feeding, if they're just getting feedings through their tubes, we can't thicken it because it could clog the tube. Um, but this is an option sometimes for those who are able to eat by their mouth. Um, again, a lot of these, like I mentioned, kind of have oral aversions. It's hard for them to eat. They don't want to eat. They push it away. Um, we have what we call swallow studies where they'll um, evaluate how they're swallowing and they can take a picture of how it's going down. Is it going into the lungs or is it going into the stomach where it's supposed to? Are they coughing with their feet? They can kind of evaluate this and they can try different thicknesses. We'll thicken the feet and then they can see, okay, well, this infant does really well with this thickness, but they can't have this thickness. So again, um, occupational therapists and the team will work together to determine what thickener is best for this baby and how we can get them to feed. Um, even with thickened feeds though, they might not take what they need to take. Um, again, as I said, if the infant really hasn't progressed or they can't take what we want them to take to grow and to thrive, then sometimes they do require surgical placement and then they can work on these feeds you can still work on them, but that way it's not so much pressure, but you have to do this before you can get out of the hospital because that could take months. Um, so, although not every infant is put on something called ECMO, um, this is like a type of bypass. It allows the lungs to rest um, while we're managing it clinically. Um, so these ones definitely have to be on TPN. They don't have the same gut flow that they would if they weren't on it. Um, and although there aren't a lot of, I know Jason was talking about research, there's not a lot of research on this, but some of the research articles have shown really, really high protein breakdown. They show that these babies need the same calories as a baby who's not on ECMO. However, the protein losses are huge. So again, we kind of our protein pushers, we try to get all that protein in them. Um, although we can't build them up and always grow them, at least we can prevent them from breaking down their muscle stores, um, which again is important for lung function, it's important for healing, it's important for breathing. So we don't want these, um, we don't want the muscles to get smaller. Um, again, these infants are also very limited on the amount of um, nutrition we can give them. They have millions of lines, it seems like just lines and lines and lines. So the, the amount that's allowed for nutrition is very limited. Although not all babies need tracheostomies, which is uh, you know an insertion that helps them be attached to the vent so they can eventually transition to home instead of having the tube down their throat. Um, some babies we do require to actually have the opposite problem. We've tried and tried and tried to get these kids to grow, and then all of a sudden they're plump and we can't get them to stop growing. Um, they're not working as hard to breathe a lot of times. The, the machine is doing it for them. And so um, we actually kind of have to things with them on diets. Um, we'll have to kind of back down on the additives and the breast milk and the formula and make it kind of a more normal, what we call a 20 calorie from standard formula. We'll kind of have to back down. And sometimes they still grow like their air ferns. We feel like if we spray them with formula, they're going to grow. So it's kind of a challenge. To, we don't want to put extra pressure on their lungs from having them gain too much weight. So it's kind of finding that same balance to making sure that they're growing lengthwise. Because if we give them too little calories, they won't. Their brains won't grow, and their, they won't gain in length. So it's kind of a fine balance. But a lot of these kids have decreased pain. Um, again, these kids continue to have increased vitamin D and bone mineral needs because of all the medications that they're on. And then. Um, these kids can eat by mouth, it depends on the child, and it depends if they're safe. If the team has decided, yes, they're safe to eat, um, they can, they still usually take little bits, or they'll kind of go through phases depending on um, if they're doing well on their ventilator, current ventilator settings, or if they got ill, or, so they're still, they're usually not taking it all by mouth when these kids have G-tubes, but um, again, they can still take tastes of things, still kind of get that sensation so that they don't lose these skills. 
follow-up nutrition is also very important. As I said, um, my coworker follows them in our special care clinic. Um, we continue to monitor their growth closely. A lot of these babies still have difficulties growing just because of all the cumulative deficits that have happened over their course of hospitalizations. Um, they grow, are they growing lengthwise? Because again, that's a better indicator. Are they getting enough nutrition? Do we need to go up in the calories? Or are they getting too plump and we need to go down in the calories? Um, they continue to look at their laboratory values, like their iron status to see if they need an iron supplement. Um, we need to adjust their vitamin D levels. Are they getting enough? Um, some of these babies still have eating intolerances. Sometimes they'll need to have smaller, more frequent meetings in order to help this. And um, the dietitian can help kind of strategize and give them high calorie options if they're eating by mouth. Um, and maybe smaller feedings. Um, and again, it's important to kind of continue to monitor their ability to feed. Are, are now they having a little bit more choking because they're starting to eat more solid foods? Is it difficult for them to eat more chunky foods or do they need to curate food even though they're a year old? Um, you know, it's important, again, they have outpatient services like occupational therapy who will work with the dietitian to swallow studies if they need to again, even if they've already had one, maybe their swallowing ability has changed. Um, and then I just kind of, wanted to see if you guys had any questions. Um, it's kind of hard to cover everything because again, every baby is so very different. Baby might have a really easy course, they might do really, really well, and then some might have a lot more struggles with nutrition and with growth. Um, very individual thing, and like I said, the dietitians are available with the team every day. We talk with the team, we talk with the families, we're always there. So depending on the patient's need, we can do them. Question. And I think this is one of our biggest challenges we have. You know, it would be really nice to try and find a way to provide adequate nutrition in the first few weeks to months of life. The babies get so far behind from everything that goes on in the beginning that to catch up sometimes is, is almost impossible. And I've never ever seen a population of patients that have such high calorie demands, you know, when, whereas kind of an all healthy term baby would need, it's just to throw out a number, 100 you know, kilocalories per kilo, these babies are needing 150 or 160, or sometimes even 200, when people look at you like, you're crazy, you didn't give that many calories to a little baby, but they just get so, so far behind, and their lungs don't heal, their wounds don't heal, surgery, healing from surgery becomes so difficult and so it really is a big, big challenge and you know, something I think if we could do better, we would definitely improve outcomes. Dr. Crawford is not growing, the lungs aren't growing and it's really true. So I think um, it's really an important part of the management. It's great that it was able to be included in the and even just the support of the lungs, like all the muscles that help to do the breathing, if you don't have the protein to support that muscles, those muscles get smaller, they get weaker, and they can't even help the lungs, even if the lungs are functioning their way. And I know Jason was mentioning too research, and it's a very hard thing to do in this population, first of all for numbers, but also you can't really randomize things, which is the best way to do things, because you can't say, you get nutrition, you don't, let's see what happens. You know, so it kind of limits us of what research is available, so a lot of what we have is observation. We have observational studies, and that's what we kind of have to do, and collect this information, and we're working on a QI project right now, I don't know if you're aware of, making sure that the babies get what they're prescribed, because a lot of these babies will order a certain amount of nutrition for them, but because of all these other things that go on, or because they have to, you know, go for a procedure, and then we have to stop their nutrition, or because their nutrition's ordered for too much, and they can't get all of that. So there's a lot of things that we're working on, and we're gonna look at numbers, and see how we can do better and present this to our team, so that they're all aware of this is where we need to do better to help these babies to heal, to grow, and to not have these cumulative deficits that last months or even longer. So do you see that they eventually start to catch up and their curve eventually within two or three or four or five years, they gain weight and get on, um, on track as far as gaining weight? I think it really depends. It's really hard to say because one of our babies, um, he 
see was like a straight line and it was just killing me. We were throwing calories at this child. We were throwing protein. We were giving him all this stuff and he just would not grow. And then now he's, even his name, they both shot up kind of at the same time. It took him very, you know, several months to get there. As I said, one of my coworkers kind of follows him in past year. Um, so, I don't know, I can't really answer that question as far as, you know, five years down the road. And some of these kids, like I said, if they have a tracheostomy or um, other things that start decreasing their needs, sometimes they have that curve. But if they don't, they still continue to burn calories. Or, like I said, they continue to have eating problems because, um, you know, they might need smaller meals when they're two and three. And I have to give them whole milk instead of decreasing them to 2% milk. Or add, you know, PD Assure every once in a while to kind of get concentrated calories in these kids when they're not, especially when they're toddlers and they their face they don't want anything and they're picky and they want to play. Playing is so much more fun than eating. That's very difficult because they need all these extra nutrition, but they don't want to take it. You can't force feed a toddler. Um, at least that probably won't lead to good things. So, um, you know, having to work with a dietitian on an outpatient basis, like maybe even though we don't like adding butter to things as adults, maybe you need to add a slab of butter to that baby's you know, vegetables, or maybe you need to add extra cream to their soup or things. So there's a lot of different, again, it'll be based on every baby. And Do you want to talk about some of those higher calorie foods? I know it's added in the book for us that you have um, smaller children that struggle with weight gain. Well, they do have like the oral supplements, like the Pediasure, um, they have some health foods, um, and now they're actually making them in higher calories, so they have to drink less volume, like I said, concentrated. Um, because again, sometimes that's these kids' problem. You can't have them drink an eight ounce, you know, glass of milk, or they're going to be full for their next feeding. So sometimes we'll encourage, you know, small and frequent snacks when they're old enough to have peanut butter without the risk of allergies. You know, adding that, adding, um, you know, butter to foods that you wouldn't normally, adding extra cream, using whole milk instead of, you know, sometimes when they're older than two, we try to decrease to 2% or 1% of fat free with these kids trying to give them the whole milk. Um, I know sometimes it really works well too if, because little kids like to play, maybe putting like a small plate of food wherever they're playing so they kind of snack on things as they're doing it. Because again, if you have an option to play or eat, you know, two years old, what do you want to do? So just having things, um, if they have a couple favorite foods, you know, maybe trying to put a couple favorite foods with a couple other foods on the plate to kind of give them a little bit of everything. Um, like I said, sometimes those supplements help with snacks. I don't like to give like the Pediasure or the other supplements right before a meal because then they're not going to eat all the foods that they should be getting. Um, so sometimes like snacks throughout the day. Um, again, bringing stuff with you. Um, it's hard to kind of have to go the opposite way of buying higher calorie foods because again, we try to promote healthy eating and try to not do that for regular kids because we don't want them to have complications down the road. Um, but having to, you know, pick creamier options or things aren't fat free. Um, I'm trying to think of, yeah, just trying to kind of add, like I said, butter or peanut butter, things that are higher in calories, creams. Um, and then for some of the babies that are still in the NICU and coming out, different, I know this is borderline OT, but some things that may help with that oral aversion or encourage them um, the steps and how slow they go and just different techniques to try and get them to be interested orally and eventually make that step to take a bottle of rest. Yeah, I don't really think I can answer that question because I don't want to, obviously you don't want to, if the kid is pushing away or to really get them, you don't want to shut it down and not say, you take this. You know, I think kind of listening to the baby's cues, um, Again, just I know that when I see our occupation therapists, they'll just start little, even just touch, even just when you're holding them, just touching their lips or just kind of getting them used to having things in their mouth. I know sometimes they'll try. I don't really know from a more detailed standpoint exactly what to do or what not to do um, to kind of encourage these things. So if you guys, you know, who are able to follow up with these services, a lot of times these babies will qualify for services at home where they can come out to your home and kind of help you with some of these things, teach the parents that you guys can do it on your own too, um, because of course they can't be there every single day, um, like they are in the hospital. So sometimes teaching the parents these methods, um, again, every kid advances at different stages. Some kids you touch their lips and they freak out, and other kids, you know, they can handle a little bit more. It's really important <coughs> to not make an issue of it. You know, it's hard because that's what we all do. Uh, Eating is so much a part of our day and so important. 
right? The kids will eat and they're ready to eat and forcing them to eat doesn't make it happen any faster. And that's what's so hard because, I mean, that's, when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you think of is, wow, what am I going to eat? <laughs> you know, but they don't think about that or even know about it. And it, it, it always comes. That it comes when each kid is ready for it to, to come. Uh, so we have some patients who follow it on clinic, and we'll talk a lot about that tomorrow, who um, you know, have a really hard time getting services and therapy and stuff, and they still learn to eat, and even without intensive feeding therapy and other things. When it comes for those kids is when cognitively they understand what food and eating is about. Now you can look at a kid who's nine months or twelve or thirteen months old. They don't really know why they need to eat or what they need to eat for, or why you're giving them food. They just the kids who've kind of grown up and done it normally just do it because that's what they've always done. At five o'clock, my mom puts me in my high chair and puts something on the plate, and usually that tastes good, so I put it in my mouth. <laughs> 